If you are studying psychology, you probably have heard things like evidence-based practice, the hierarchy of evidence, Cronbach's alpha, and many more. Since psychology is going pretty much the same route as other sciences like physics or chemistry, there is a need to heavily rely on the fundamental goals of scientific inquiry, including the pursuit of knowledge, the use of empirical evidence, and the application of systematic methods. But can we trust the science as it is? Like how do we know if the research is telling us the truth? And can scientists lie about their results? Let me answer the last question first. While it is hard to forge results of the research, it is not impossible. Let's look at the story as an example. Paul Kammerer was an Austrian biologist who gained fame in the early 20th century for his experiments involving toads and his support for the theory of Lamarckism. Lamarckism proposed that organisms could pass on acquired characteristics to their offspring in contrast to the idea of Darwinian natural selection. We can use these both theories to understand why giraffes have a long neck. Those who support Lamarckism theory would argue that all ancestral giraffes had short necks. As these giraffes faced the challenge of reaching higher foliage for food, they stretched their necks repeatedly over their lifetimes. Through this effort, their necks gradually lengthened. These acquired longer necks would then be passed on to their offspring. Thus, in subsequent generations, giraffes would be born with longer necks due to the cumulative effects of their stretching in the ancestors. The supporters of the Darwinian natural selection, on the other hand, would propose that there was a natural variation in neck length between the ancestral giraffes. Some giraffes had shorter necks, while others had slightly longer necks. In a habitat where leaves were too high to reach, giraffes with longer necks had a survival advantage. They could reach more food and have a higher chance of surviving and reproducing compared to individuals with shorter necks. As a result, the genes responsible for longer necks were passed on to the next generation at a higher frequency. Over time, through the process of natural selection, the average neck length of giraffes in the population increased, as longer necked individuals were more likely to pass on their genes. Anyways, returning to Paul Kammerer, he conducted a series of experiments with amphibians, but gained his fame for his research on midwife toads. He subjected these poor toads to various conditions, including heat, cold, light, and chemical substances. His goal was to trigger the development of black spots or pads on their thumbs, similar to those found in other species. He believed that these acquired traits would then be inherited by subsequent generations, providing evidence for Lamarckian inheritance. Initially, Kammerer reported positive results, claiming that the toads developed the desired black mating pads on their thumbs. These findings gained attention and fueled the ongoing debate between supporters of Lamarckism and skeptics. However, it was later discovered that some of Kammerer's experimental results were likely falsified. The situation escalated when fellow scientists and investigators discovered suspicious inconsistencies and irregularities in his data and research practices. One of the most incriminating pieces of evidence against Kammerer's credibility was the discovery of artificially inserted black ink into the mating pads of the toads. This led to strong suspicion that he had manipulated the results of his experiments to support his Lamarckian theories. The accusations of forgery and the subsequent loss of scientific credibility took a toll on Kammerer's mental well-being. Overwhelmed by the scandal and the weight of public scrutiny, he ended his own life. There is a book by Arthur Kostler called The Case of the Midwife Toad, which presents the story in a slightly different light, where Kammerer had actually been framed. The link will be in the description. You may say, well, Kammerer wasn't a psychologist. Sure, but Lamarckism, if proven, would play a big role for psychology as a science as well, potentially explaining, for example, the inheritance of personality traits. Besides, it is not the only case of fraud in the scientific community. There was also a physicist named Jan Hendrik Schoen, who had allegedly made significant breakthroughs in the field of nanotechnology, but in 2002 it was discovered that he had fabricated and falsified data in several papers. Or John Darcy, oh, whoops, a medical researcher and physician in Harvard Medical School, who fabricated and manipulated data in numerous scientific papers. Or Huang Wu Suk, who had fabricated data and falsely claimed to have created patient-specific stem cell lines, leading to the retraction of papers and significant damage to his reputation. There was also a guy named Andrew Wakefield, who had published a fraudulent study in 1998, claiming a link between the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine and autism, and psychologists as well. Mark Hauser, who studied primate behavior, Cyril Burt, who conducted influential studies on intelligence and heritability, as well as fabricated data and made up to 
studies to support his theories. A social psychologist Diedrich Staple, oh, he was the MVP of research fraud. He fabricated data in multiple studies and experiments, resulting in the retraction of 58 publications. Staple's actions highlighted the importance of peer review and replication in scientific research. Speaking of peer review, imagine you're a researcher who has just conducted a study and wants to publish findings in a scientific journal. Before your work can be accepted for publication, it undergoes a process called peer review. Peer reviewers are typically other researchers who have knowledge and expertise in the subject area of your study. Their role is to evaluate the quality, validity, and significance of your research. They assess various aspects of your study, including their research design, methodology, data analysis, conclusions, and overall contribution to the field. Reviewers may also check if your work adheres to ethical guidelines and follows proper scientific standards. Based on their assessment, the reviewers provide feedback and recommendations to the journal editor. They might suggest revisions, offer constructive criticism, or raise questions to address any potential flaws or gaps in your research. The editor then shares the reviewer's feedback with you, giving you an opportunity to make necessary revisions and improvements to your paper. The revised version of your paper is then resubmitted for another round of review. This iterative process continues until the reviewers and editor are satisfied with the quality and rigor of your research. Once your paper successfully completes the peer review process and any required revisions, it can be accepted for publication in the scientific journal. How all these papers get published then? Well, while peer review is an essential component of the scientific publishing process, it is not flawless and cannot catch every instance of research misconduct or data forgery. There are a few reasons why some scientists have been able to forge their results and still publish papers. One of them is human error and oversight. Peer reviewers are experts in their fields, but they can still overlook or miss certain issues in a paper. They may not have the resources or time to thoroughly scrutinize every aspect of a study. As well as in most cases, reviewers simply trust the integrity of the researchers and assume that the data and results are genuine. Reviewers typically do not have access to the raw data behind a study. They rely on the information and analysis presented in the paper. If researchers manipulate or fabricate their data, it becomes challenging for reviewers to detect such misconduct without access to the original data sets. There is also a problem of replication and verification. Replicating studies and verifying results can be time-consuming and resource-intensive. The scientific community may not always have the capacity or incentive to replicate every published study, especially those with groundbreaking claims. As a result, fraudulent results may go unnoticed or unchallenged for an extended period, which is also worsened by the lack of reporting and investigation. Not all cases of research misconduct are immediately reported or thoroughly investigated. Whistleblowers or skeptical colleagues may raise concerns, but the investigative process can be complex and time-consuming. As to motivation to forge results, the main reason probably remains the pressure to publish. The academic and scientific community often places a significant emphasis on publishing research findings. Researchers may face pressure to produce groundbreaking results or publish frequently to secure funding, advance their careers, or gain recognition. This pressure can create the motivation for some scientists to engage in fraudulent practices to achieve desired outcomes. One of the very recent examples that demonstrates reasons from this list is a case of Sylvain Lisney, who in 2006 has published a groundbreaking research on beta amyloid 56. He showed how injecting young rats with a specific form of amyloid caused them to start exhibiting memory defects, which was pioneering in the context of Alzheimer's disease. The paper was fifth highest cited paper in Alzheimer's research, with over 2,000 citations. Lesnay has produced a large number of other studies following up on this idea. Many Alzheimer's researchers tried but were unable to replicate the findings, and most did not publish those efforts. Then there was Matthew Schrag, a neuroscientist who has been contacted to investigate allegations against biotech cassava sciences over its drug Simufilam. While doing that, he had examined Papier, an online site where researchers flag suspected problems in published work and spotted complaints about figures in Lesney's work. Digging deeper, he flagged figures in 20 Lesney's papers, 10 of which involved beta amyloid 56. The problems included duplicated bands on western blots, as well as images that seemed to be composites from different experiments or figures reprinted in later papers as though new. Obviously, Schrag submitted his concerns to National Institute of Health in January 2022 and alerted journals which have published these papers. The investigation has started in July of 2000. 2022 and is still ongoing. A few other researchers had commented on the issue, especially those who have co-authored some of the papers. 
And there was a particularly interesting article published in Science by chemist Derek Lovey that I highly recommend you to read. He also mentions the human error and oversight, the problem of replication and verification, and lack of reporting and investigation. So, indeed, there were cases of data forgery and scientific misconduct. Does it mean that we shouldn't trust the science? Well, no. It's not like you should stop eating strawberries if one of them turns out bad. While there have been cases of fraud, most scientific papers are maintaining scientific integrity, so there is no need to worry. But it is also important to think critically when analyzing the results and consider limitations of the study. I guess there is a lot more stuff I can say in the context of psychological research, but for now, that's it. Thank you for watching the video till the end, and I'll see you in the next one.